Welcome, Legends. It's time for Tack Room Talk. Proudly brought to us by our friends at Silver Lining Herbs. And now your host, from Buell, Idaho, a Wrangler National Finals bareback rider, Josie Young. On this week's episode of Tack Room Talk, I got one of my favorite people, my dad, Mickey Young. We're going to be talking about the history of Silver Lining and a little bit about where he came from. So, welcome to the show, Mickey. Hey, thanks, son. It's good to be back. Or dad, whatever I should call you. But we also have another guy here, the awkward guy himself, <laughs> Chance Shootnik. Yeah, I'm, I'm keeping it cool today, so uh, no awkwardness on, on this end of the... <laughs> and there I go. I ruined it already. <laughs> there comes the awkwardness. There it is. Right now. Well, well, at least now we can all see it. It's all right. Hey, I'm, I'm comfortable now. There Got the nerves go. out of me. There it is. You know, this audio sounds really good, too. Don't you think? <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> uh, let, me, <clears throat> let me adjust my headphones just a little bit. Yeah, actually, he doesn't have headphones on. I should ask my dad. Third what, wheel. What do you think about this audio? It's amazing. I can hear myself talk. Uh, I wonder if we could get one of these for my spouse. She sometimes doesn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we all probably Actually, keep that between us. Her, huh? We should get a bundle deal because I've got a spouse like that as well. <laughs> and Chance is the only smart one. He's, he's I, nice I'm just keeping it. quiet at this. <laughs> he's not speaking moment. up. That's that's a good thing. Hey, I'm I, I'm I'm a glutton for punishment. You know, sometimes I don't care. Always liked a good fight. <laughs> <laughs> No, the backstory. We we finally got some new equipment in here, and and we hope that you guys all like the the sound of it. But I want to roll in and kind of talk about the 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 place that you came from and and how you got your start on on Silver Lining. But I want to go way back to where um, where were you born? I, I want to tell everybody where you came from and where you were raised, and and talk about that a little bit. The dinosaur era. No, well, that's before the dinosaurs. Oh heck! Yeah, that was right when dirt was made. <laughs> didn't, but, didn't you say that you that you used to ride a dinosaur puppy to school every day? That's I used to rodeo when they used dinosaur puppies for horses, and so anyway, um, I was born at Moab, Utah. My dad was uh, working for a cattle company down there, and it was thirty miles from the actual town of Moab to where we lived, and it was a little line shack, which has since been burned down. But it was uh, just the length of a railroad tie long and two railroad or wide and two railroad ties long, and that's what it was built out of. It was built into like the side of the hill. Like eight feet by sixteen feet. Yeah, and uh, your house, it, the house, and it was it had a dirt roof on it, dirt top on it, and uh, my dad cowboyed for uh, a guy by the name of Cecil Thompson, and and my mom. Uh, cooked for a seismograph crew there and us kids spent most of our time as little Hold kids on. following them following that what is out. what is a seismograph crew they're the ones that mapped out all of these squares across the united states that you see from the sky when you're they're the ones that uh map the country in fact the world and so uh these guys spend all their time out there and she cooked out of a tent and a wood burning stove and us kids just kind of run wild and got uh, tan lines that were no tan lines <laughs> <laughs> so how long were you in a house that that size for like till you're like uh when my brother started school uh, i was five and he was seven he started school in moab so we moved 15 miles from town and then uh uh moved into a real house still didn't have electricity uh he caught a ride every day with the secretary the principal secretary who lived in in uh thompson and she drove to moab to to uh to go to school and picked larry up there and then when i got old enough to start school start into kindergarten i went on the trip too and then after my half day of kindergarten i was turned loose to look for my brother and they finally realized that this little guy running around looking through the class windows needed to be put in put somewhere so they put me in the afternoon session of kindergarten too and 
So that's that's why I'm so brilliant. I got two years of kindergarten. <laughs> AM, PM, AM, kindergarten. PM. Wow. Two, two crackers, two two cartons of milk. Yeah, I was li- I was rolling. So, so one thing that I that I've always remembered uh, you telling me stories about was that you used to make a little bit of money delivering newspapers. Well, that was after we moved on up to Wellington. When I was uh, seven years old, we moved from our place by Moab up to Wellington, and uh, and I started school there. I was in an area where the kids were kind of tough. All those little old coal mining kids were tough, and they were mean. They wanted, everyone wanted a chance to whip me because I was new, and and it scared me and I didn't want to go to school so I told my mom and the teacher wouldn't let me in so she her little fiery attitude took me and headed to the school to find out why and of course then the real story came out I got in trouble for telling a story that wasn't true and but anyway I got got put in school and uh and uh then when I was a teenager um I was breaking horses and started most of my dad's colts, and then, and then I got a, a paying job delivering newspapers, and I would take the colts and put a bag across the pommel of the saddle and fill it full of the newspapers, and I tell people sometimes the people even got their newspapers. <laughs> and so there was lots of times when not I Not a trail horse you were riding then. Not necessarily, and a lot of times you'd have to get off the horse and roll a newspaper up and take it walk up the sidewalk and put it in the door or something and that horse would have to wait for you and sometimes they wouldn't and so I'd end up having to follow him until I could get my get my ride back and then go and resume but once I got my horses kind of broke to where they could know the the path and the and the route then I could do that that route in about 15 minutes and the boy that took it after I got through uh, had a bicycle and it'd take him almost two hours a night to do it and I could do it in 15 minutes because I could cut corners I could go over the hill and he had to pedal all the way around through town to get over on the other side of the town and so, so you're like legit Pony Express then yeah I was I, I was in fact and I wasn't the first one in the area that did it uh, a guy by the name of Jesse Rich was the first one he was two or three years older than me and he was really a tough guy and a tough kid all of us kids were scared of him and and I thought that's really cool that he did that and so of course when I got a chance I got a paper route and and delivered newspapers and that was my first legit job but you know you get 35 cents at that time I was getting 35 cents a month per customer and I had to go and collect it and then I had to take the money off of it and send the rest of it to Deseret News who was who I delivered for so did jesse rich get uh, jealous that you started in on the no paper? jesse was jesse was over it jesse uh walked out one morning to to catch his horse and the horse was standing with his butt <clears throat> next to the gate he didn't know jesse was there jesse reached and touched his horse on the butt uh to let him know that he was there the horse jumped forward and kicked that gate and the gate hit Jesse right at the top lip and cut all of his teeth off right at the right at the gum line and fold him back Holy in against heck. his roof roof of his mouth and and uh broke his jaw and when he when he was healing up from that he decided he'd rather do something else and so he never delivered newspapers anymore after that in fact I think uh I think my brother got his route and then I ended up getting a route from for the other newspaper hmm so how long did you live in Wellington for? I uh, moved there when I was seven and left there when I was 18. Went on the rodeo trail, had the rodeo bug, and had to go get out of town and go see if I could do it. So I want to I back up just a touch because I, you know, one of the big sayings that's been going around the office here is, is you know, to do great things, you got to put out massive action. And uh, when I think about you learning how to ride bucking horses, um, you definitely had it a lot more difficult than I did. I had everything, you know, set up for me, including an indoor arena that you had built. And, uh, but you, on the other hand, had to work a little harder at practicing to learn how to ride bucking horses. Well, that's, yeah, I did have to work at it quite a bit harder, but I was quite a bit less talented than you was too. But, uh, uh, 
I, I knew how to ride a saddle horse really good, and for me to learn to lean back and do the things, and then I didn't have any really good instruction. There was nobody around there that really knew. Uh, the best in the area was a guy by the name of Austin Henry, and he was a friend, and, and he showed me a lot of the basics. But uh, when I let my dad know that that's what I wanted to do, he showed up with five head of practice horses, and they were just rejects from an amateur company there and uh, they were not desirable horses for a beginner there was one that'd take a long run and then break and duck and dive and throw you into the fence and he could do that to me regularly and <laughs> and uh, then there was another one that that would uh, hurt you in the buck and shoot he'd fall over backwards they'd in fact got rid of him for that reason uh, so it taught me a lot of the things on how to get you know, my shoot procedures and everything, even though it was really hard on me, uh, I got really good at it because it was a self-preservation type of thing, you know. But uh, So how old were you, like, when you first started riding your very first bucking horse? Thirteen. Thirteen. And by the time I was uh, in high school, uh, 16 and 17, I was, I was kind of one to be dealt with in the amateur rodeos around there. I was kind of catching on to it a little bit, and and I wasn't, uh, I, I was riding more of them than I was getting bucked off of, and, and I was kind of going through the motions, which most people wasn't at the time. There was no videos or anything like that to watch, and so I would see pictures of these guys. I, I uh, got involved with the PRCA, uh, newsrooms and stuff and so I got the the rodeo sports news at the time uh, later became the pro rodeo sports news but I got involved with that and and I'd see pictures of Clyde Van Voris and and uh, uh, the Mayo brothers and and all of those guys riding and I and I'd cut those pictures out and put them in my hat and I'd look at them and I'd I'd try to do what they was doing but I had no idea about timing or prying on my arm and you know, I had a permit and had been to quite a few pro rodeos before I heard somebody say, you need to pry on your arm. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa what, what was that? And he told me, and I thought, well, I've been on a lot of horses and didn't know that. <laughs> so I started learning, you know, and as I learned those little pieces of information uh, and added them to my repertoire, it became easier. And, and so then I had, you know, it, it's a hard foundation, but it's a really solid foundation because you learn why not to do all those things, you know, and so. So okay. it literally was a trial and error type of thing for quite some time. It was, and, and the, my first rigging, you could grab it by the back behind the handhold and you could, you can flop it up like this and the, the D-rings would flop over the top of it. I mean, it, it was just a loose body. <clears throat> just a grab and go it that's not like, how they are anymore <laughs> they're not that way anymore in fact i i i used that rigging until i got my permit and then i bought a i bought a charlie beals rigging and it had a leather and rawhide handhold in it lots of give in it still but but quite a bit more firm than what i'd been using and then um as i was on my permit and just about to get it filled i got my first jim houston rigging which is a hard rigging and the handhold was rawhide, and man, I had trouble with it. It just, you know, it just seemed like it just, the jerk was just so intense that I didn't know how to deal with it. And it took me probably four months to where I got comfortable taking the jerk and and so on. And and I got to where I, I finally got it, caught on to it, and then I started winning with that, and then I was kind of on the road to... I feel like there needs to be a t-shirt made for bareback riders called take the jerk <laughs> because that's <laughs> for sure. That's uh that's pretty much what you do. That's pretty much, uh, you know, somebody said one time it was like, uh, it, they said, well, how much jerk is there? And I says, well, if you was to get ready to water ski and put about 50 foot of coils in the water right in front of you <laughs> and then tell that guy go. And when he hit the end of that and all them coils come out of there and you hit that, the end of that, and that right there were, is where 
the cowboy meets the bucking horse right there somewhere. It's just <laughs> about what goes on. Well, that sounds really fun. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a great way to make a living, and it's it and as you you know, we've got a I've got a grandson, Josie's son, that wants to re- do this, and it's just really hard for me to want to have him do it because it's it is such an intense. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, you learn so many amazing well, I, things. I mean, I just, I just think back of the, uh, the wrecks that I took with direction. <laughs> I can only imagine the wrecks without direction. Yeah. So, what's your worst, worst wreck like early on in your, your career? Oh my gosh, that's, uh, it's a car wreck a minute, you know. So it's like, <laughs> it's like it's pretty, it's pretty crazy, but. Uh, the one that hurt me the most, I was in a high school rodeo. Actually, it was a college rodeo, but they let the high school <clears throat> students enter it if they had a, a college card. And I, I don't know how that worked even now, but anyway, I had a college card, so I entered, and I had a saddle bronc throw me over his head and then jumped on my back and uh, broke a couple of ribs away from my back, but he collapsed one what they call a spontaneous collapse on one of my lungs and that was more fun than you need in a few seconds it's like really really painful yeah that sounds like a good good wreck (laughs) and so i uh i still had a bull to get on and i was i had won some of the bareback riding and hadn't won any of the bronc riding so now i had to win some in the bull riding and i was behind the buck and shoots trying to be tough enough to get on my bull and i finally passed out and woke up on my way to the hospital and they took me down and then they had me stand up straight and put your chin up in this little this little cup and I couldn't stand to stand up straight <laughs> pure torture <laughs> oh my gosh they could they, yeah the medical field used to really hurt you to do stuff so anyway then they found out that my lung was collapsed and so that that ended my bull riding career because they said if it ever happened again it would you know most a lot of guys that had it happen or people had it happen died when it happened and so then i thought well i spent more than my share of the time underneath them bulls anyway so it probably wouldn't be a good idea to keep doing that so i quit doing that and just rode bareback horses after that so so when when you bought your prca card do you remember what year that was uh i think 1970 Four, I filled my permit and and bought my card. And then your first national finals rodeo was 1976. Yep. And where was that at? Oklahoma City in the uh, State Fair building. They now have the U.S. Team Roping Championships there. But at the time, and they've done a lot of lot of work at the time. In 1976, our warm up arena was adjacent to the State Fair Coliseum and and it had about a four foot fresh air gap right at the top of the wall and uh and uh it was cold in there and the the stock help and the people that was working there had salamander heaters which are a diesel propane or diesel or propane heater that would they'd be huddled up around but us guys that was riding and at that time everybody had to uh ride a saddle horse in the grand entry everybody the bareback riders you know now they exclude the bareback riders because it's the first event but at that time everybody had to ride in the grand entry well i was the only one from utah that had qualified that had qualified for the nfr so i carried the utah flag and at that time they gave people free tickets for horses to ride in the grand entry so people would bring their horses to let the cowboys ride in the grand entry and sometimes they weren't broke much and the horse i had to carry the Amer- carry the utah flag with was scared to death of that flag and uh so when i'd start in that arena on a and they wanted us to go at a pretty brisk lope and by the time i got down around that arena we was i had no control i was on full-fledged runoff and uh it was wearing my left arm out, which is the one I used to ride bucking horses with, and uh, had my right hand onto, on a flagpole. And so after that first day doing that, I thought, I have got to climb the ladder so I'm not 
the first one to go after coming out of the grand entry. Because I had to, you know, when the grand entry lift, left the arena, they said, you know, the slack that they did cut us was that we didn't have to ride our horses back out to the stalls. So we could get off at the gate and then get over the buck and shoots and put our gloves on and pull our riggings and and we had the time of the national Holy anthem. <laughs> so, so a little different so, than the first time you made the finals. Yeah, huh? so that that was your motivation to climb the ladder, so you didn't have to ride the grand entry horse. That, that scared ho- to death. That of horse, horse. <laughs> that horse scared me into riding good. I mean, it was amazing. I've seen some really good bronc rides made back there in that warm up arena. People bring their horses there and got a free ticket, and I thought, you know what, we can get an NFR cowboy to ride our horse, and so they bring horses that a lot of them couldn't ride. And for sure. and they'd put him in that arena, and the, them guys would get on. It was cold, and and your hands would be cold, and they, you had to take your coat off because they wanted you in your shirts. They didn't want a bunch of different coats in there. But those early pictures of me riding at the NFR, there were a lot of the people in the stands around them, bucking shoots and stuff that had their winter coats on, and you could see the steam coming out of the ho- horses' nostrils as they bucked and. It was like it, it changed a lot over the years. I, I think about the uh, the horses that were a little bronchy acting. There's a couple stock contractors still to this day or still till I w- was done rodeoing that you might want to bear down at when you take the victory lap at the rodeos. I would so, say those flag horses are kind of ranked still today. At least they're a good well, runoff at least. There was a couple stock contractors that were kind of not- notorious mm-hmm. for maybe having one that was a little little bit bronchy. They they could they felt like it sold tickets and their job is to sell rodeo tickets so if they can buck somebody off don't matter where it's at a lot of times they do it and it cracks me up because there's a lot of guys there's a lot of guys that learn how to ride bucking horses or bulls but they never really learned how to ride a saddle horse so they they struggle riding a, a broke saddle horse and then you put them on one that's a little bronchy and <laughs> yeah it's it's quite the show it's quite the show watching them ride a broke one <laughs> yeah, yeah watching a bull rider rider broke saddle horse is uh that's usually I mean, pretty funny <laughs> i mean don't get me wrong there's some guys out there that are dang sure handy at, at uh riding a saddle horse but there's a few that are not so much that's right yeah and i and and there's there's some bull riders you like jb mooney is like a really good cowboy you know what i mean and and chris uh chris shivers shivers and, yeah he's you a good know mike uh Mike White. Mike White. White. Yeah, yeah he's I mean, great. There's he guys great. that are really, really talented. Ross there. Coleman's pretty handy. Ross Coleman. I mean, gosh, I mean, there's a there's a long list of guys that can, Sh- but there Shane, might be a, a, kind of a short list of guys that don't so well, and they're fun to watch. You know, Shane Proctor's <laughs> one that I think of. Uh, he ropes calves pretty good, and uh, he's he also rides saddle bronc horses really well too. So, you know, there's some guys out there, dang shirt sure, cowboys. Yeah, but. Uh, yeah, so not uh, 1976 NFR Cowboys though, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, you're not you're not cowboy unless you're 1976 cowboy. Yeah, well, I, well, you know, I used to I used to look at those old NFR p- pictures, those guys in like t- 1959 and, you know, in Dallas and in Los Angeles and and stuff. And I thought, man, that is forever ago. And now from now back to 1976 was like twice as long as it was from 76 to 59. And I'm thinking, holy heck, where did this go? How did I get this dang old? So <clears throat> I want to back up a little bit. You said you were carrying the Utah flag. Wasn't you the first guy that qualified for National Finals Rodeo from Utah? I was. Uh, Clyde Frost qualified, but he wasn't, uh, well, he was living in Utah, but he was from Colorado. Mm-hmm. And so... Uh, but I was the first guy that was born and raised in Utah that made it to the national finals rodeo from Utah. Little fun fact of the day, right there, folks. Yeah, they came in droves after I broke the ice. Though you know, it wasn't long after I made it that Lance Robinson come along, won the all around for the world. Uh, Jack Hannum, uh, uh, Louis Field. Uh, of course, Louis traveled with me the first year. He had a card. Uh, we rodeoed together, and uh, Danny Brady jumped in there with us. He's from Nevada, and and so we we just kind of was a, a little bunch that, you know, the little trains that nobody thought could, but we did. And uh, anyway, it was it was, those was good times. But there's a lot of guys went ahead from Utah. Of course, you know, most recently probably is the Wright brothers, and there's like a 114 of them, and all of them ride good. 
I, and, I showed uh, Chance. I think we were in Scottsdale, and I seen a video of the of the, the next, next one. The next one at a <laughs> high school. There's more. He's at a high school or an amateur rodeo the other day, and uh, I said, "Watch this. This is a right." And it, and he goes, "Oh yeah, I don't doubt that." And I go. It's the one you ain't seen yet. <laughs> and he looked better than the rest of them. I mean, it's oh unbelievable. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I don't know what is in the water down there, but they uh, they they ride awfully tough. I really like I really like Stetson just because of the fact that he he can ride them bulls. Two event good guy, yeah, <laughs> he rides bulls very well. And you know, and and I don't know how many people really seen that coming, but you know, where he didn't qualify for the NFR and the bronc riding last year, and went ahead and win the all around i mean the only reason he didn't qualify in the bronc riding last year is because he broke his jaw at dodge city last year he was in the top 15 in the bronc riding broke his jaw in the bull riding at dodge city and had to sit out the last two months or a month and a half of the season or he probably have made it last year i'm almost positive he would have but, but he's qualified in both events this year he is and so, see, he's going to be, he's going to be a force to be reckoned with again, you know. Yeah, so I mean, and and these guys, you know, it's crazy. I mean, you got five or six brothers that's and dad that's older than you that that showed you the way, and you said, look. And meanwhile, he's sitting back there. Man, how can I win this all around deal too? You know, and you know, I, and just shows up and does it. It's I like would crazy. think that <clears throat> Cody's dad and Cody ought to be awfully proud. Just you know, I mean, <clears throat> you got. You got all Cody and his brothers that made it and were were huge names. And then here comes all of Cody's boys along. And it's like, holy cow, it just doesn't stop. I think I said, it was a few years ago I said this, but we did the math somehow. And and when Cody started, he had won the, bronc, the, the saddle bronc riding um, championship in the state of Utah for the high school deal. I think he won it all four years. And then when he was out, his brothers came in and between all of them, they won it every year. And then after they went out the next year, Cody's boys were old enough to start coming and then they've won it and he's got boys in there still. Isn't, isn't their sister married to a top yeah, bronc Cor- rider? Yeah. Yeah. No, they're not. Now you're putting me on the, on the spot Coburn here. Bradshaw. Yeah. Coburn Bradshaw. Yeah. I don't know why I had a brain fart <laughs> yeah. right there, but. Coburn rides really well too. Yeah. So, no, so there, I mean, it's it's crazy just how. But anyway, I think he rode good before so it all comes he back met to her too. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> so it all comes back to you, I guess. You're the you're the. Start I had the nothing, momentum. Right? I had nothing to do with any of that. But I. But what I did do is broke the ice. I think. Uh, maybe you did have something talk. to do with it. Maybe it was inspiration. Yeah. Maybe. You know. Uh, I know when I was trying to make it to my first NFR, it was a struggle. I won Denver that year, and then and so after Denver, I was leading the world, and that's a little hard for a country boy from Wellington, Utah, to take. So anyway, I, I thought, yeah, this is easy. Well, I slipped clear down out of the top 15 throughout the year, and uh, by the time the last rodeo came along for the qualification for that year, I had to win. The short round and split or, and win third in the average to make it to my first NFR. And Lonnie Hall and I was really close together, 15th and 16th. He thought he had it made, so he took off and went deer hunting in South Dakota. I went to Cal Palace in San Francisco. I ended up winning the short round on the Bucking Horse of the Year that year, a uh, horse by the name of Mr. Smith, Smith and Velvet. And then, uh, uh, I needed to be 79 points to win third while I was 78. And I thought, oh, my gosh, are you kidding me? I'm going to lose the entire year by one, one point. point. <laughs> and anyway, what it done was I was thinking I was thinking I had to be 79. Well, 78 made me split third and fourth. It gave me $28 more than I needed <laughs> to qualify for my first final. So I went to the first finals, like I said, carrying the flag in 15th position. And so... I was the first, they reverse order at the, as, as you ride, and I was uh, 15th coming in, so I was first to perform at the NFR. And uh, like I said, this horse was wearing my riding arm out before I ever got to the buck and shoots. And so that was, like I said, the, the motivation for me to get out of that go hole. I had to ride good. <laughs> and so, 
anyway. So you went on and you went to 11 consecutive national finals rodeo, um, three of which were the first three years it was at Las Vegas. But somewhere in the mix, you decided to get mixed up in the stock contracting business. What year was that? Well, uh, 1981, uh, I start, I'd been putting on rodeo schools, and I'd, I'd lease horses for the schools and bulls. And uh, then I started finding chances. You know, people would ask me, hey, who, who do I sell this bucking horse to? I got a buck and a horse that I need to sell. And, and so I started buying them. And when I'd buy them, I fell in love with them. I liked them. I really liked those horses that bucked and bulls that was bucky and, and would hook you and stuff. And I thought, you know, I just had rodeo all over me. And so I got to thinking, you know, I don't want to sell these. And... In fact, I did sell my first couple, and they went to Doran Camp, and oh, I just hated it when they loaded and left. And so I thought, you know, I'm not selling any more of those. So I started accumulating them, and pretty soon I had like 40 head of bucking horses. And, of course, not all of them was the best, but they was— What did the, Mom say about all that? Uh, she was concerned that we had more than we needed. <laughs> and uh, Well, I was just thinking about how many horses you have now. Uh, they're like a forever home once you, you own a horse. Yeah, I hate to sell them when I get them. I mean, now uh, comes out the story. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, when we, get, when we get them good ones, you know, it's hard to send them. So, anyway, I, st- I, I, I had all these horses and started looking for bulls. And, anyway, it just led us on another another challenging chapter of my life you know uh, there hadn't been a lot of people who had started rodeo companies from scratch in fact somebody said uh, I was the first one from 1951 that started a pro rodeo company and went ahead and got my card and, and built it all from scratch and uh, I don't know if that's fact or not but it makes me really feel good so I'm going to say it is it must be must be fact I mean well, you're the trailblazer, obviously, so uh, of course it's true. What about it? So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, then as we had all this livestock, I said, well, we'll just start putting on some, some rodeos. Well, I couldn't stand the thoughts of putting on amateur rodeos because that's not, you know, I mean, I've climbed this ladder. I want to get above that. And so, but I had no idea how hard it was to get contracts for pro rodeos when you had no background. And so... Uh, our first year, we had to bring in five new rodeos, and that was a that was a rule that they implemented that year for me and Rudy Vela. And Rudy Vela was a really good bull man from Texas. And uh, turned out that first year, you couldn't be at the NFR unless you had five new rodeos. And Rudy never never got it, but uh, he never got them them five rodeos. But he got to take bulls to the NFR. But they still they held me to it. I couldn't go, and so. Uh, the following year, I made sure I had the five rodeos. And two of those rodeos, I went back to where I was born in Moab and where I was raised in Price, resurrected those rodeos, and then put Winnemucca, Nevada with them. Uh, they was going to go amateur that year because they wasn't happy with what they had been getting. And then Rupert, Idaho had the same story. They was through and, and decided they would they was going to go amateur, and, and I resurrected them. And then... Uh, the fifth one was with Western Days Rodeo and Celebration here in Twin Falls, and Lori and I just took the contract and put our own money up and put the rodeo on, and that was actually our first of the five was at uh, Twin Falls, and got all my buddies to come and support it. And it wasn't that at the college? It was at the college, and uh, we put on a rodeo there, a pro rodeo. Our first one was right here in Twin Falls, Idaho, and so... Uh, and you know, and then I was still riding bucking horses. I had to do something to pay for this new habit I had. And of course, it takes if a lot. Pro rodeo of... wasn't uh, profitable enough. You thought <laughs> might as well be a stock contractor too, right? Oh my gosh! I mean, I I look back on it. I think, what the heck? I mean, I would just had whoop your ass in in my blood, you know? <laughs> just, I mean, really, I. I, I can't even imagine somebody doing some of this stuff, but I did it, and uh, 
our first that first year at Rupert we had a wall tent for our rodeo office and <laughs> and I thought it was cool but you know of course not everybody did <laughs> but I still hear once in a, yeah no Lori got along good with it. Lori has been a trooper she has never ever backed up from anything we've done she's hated some of it but she's <laughs> never not put out a hundred percent to try to make it happen so yeah. no she's been she's been a trooper I mean but well she's needed so, to be it sounds like yeah no i uh it, it's it's pretty crazy when you look back on it but but we was able to get through them them five rodeos and uh and you had stock at the nfr that year then no uh we had to hold the first two years they held us off and then the following year i took uh i took 10 head Oh wow! Yeah, the next year, and but that gave me actually it was a good thing at the time. I didn't think so. I needed money, and I was trying to make a living riding bucking horses. And and just the week before we had our first rodeo at Twin Falls, I was at Hayward, California, and uh, I had my rigging slipped under one's belly. The only time it ever happened, but I made the trip, and that's not a good place to hang around down there. And I had a horse called. Uh, uh, warrior of, of cotton rosters and he had a scar from his his shoulder to his his whirl bone clear across his side from being stupid trying to run through a fence and when somebody was around and stuff but he was like a just really really uh wild that alley uh stout quarter horse type horse and i got under him and he kicked me and kicked on me and kicked on me the full length of the arena my hand finally he stepped on my chest and pulled my hand out of my rigging and uh, I wasn't sure I wasn't going to die right there and I I got really uh, uh, it changed my life it made me make promises to God that I have never been sorry for but anyway the follow just that that happened on Saturday and the following Thursday I had my first rodeo at Twin Falls and I was one of the pickup men and I uh, flew home the next day and, and uh, from San Francisco. Lori picked me up, and she didn't know it was me because I, when I got off the airplane, I couldn't stand up straight. I was hunched over and just I was hurt, hurt everywhere, you know. And, uh, and uh, she thought I was a little old man. She had recognized me now, but at the time, <laughs> <laughs> at the time she didn't recognize me. So anyway... Uh, I walked in and she said she said she looked around and didn't see me anywhere I thought well I wonder if he didn't get on his airplane and then she seen me standing over by the exit sign and said well well you all right and I said yeah I guess so but anyway then that week one of my best bulls jumped the fence and broke a leg and I mean man I was being firebranded right about then but we went ahead and had the rodeo on Thursday Friday and Saturday and it worked good it turned out good other than the bulls getting out in Twin Falls, everything was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, there's story after story we could tell. So, yeah. how many how many times did you take stuff to the NFR? Stop. stop. Uh, I took them there eight years. So, and then you decided to sell this rodeo company in what year? Ninety one. Nineteen. Spring of spring of ninety one, we sold. So there's one more. There's one more thing to this puzzle that you did and. And that was, you also went to the National Finals Rodeo as a stock contractor as well. well pickup man. Or, yeah, pickup man. Sorry, I had a fly on my deal I was watching. But, uh, <laughs> you, you also went there as a pickup man. So what year was that? 1989. Yeah. 89 was, was a challenging year as well. That was the year, as mo <laughs> most rodeo fans know, that was the year Lane Frost got killed. Mm -hmm. And Lane was a... A good friend of the family and loved you kids so yeah that was tough but it was a good year you know it seemed like every time there's a big challenge there's also good rewards comes along somewhere yeah and you're and you've you've talked with uh lane's parents every year since <laughs> since then they're they're really good people they're they're awesome people and uh Actually, you know, our family goes back a ways even before that because when Clyde and, and Joe, was Clyde's brother, uh, lived in Utah, they lived uh, just outside La Pointe, 
on a ranch. And when they moved to Oklahoma, my uncle Bob bought their ranch. And that's where my mom and dad lived when they passed away. It was They was living on that ranch. And that arena that them guys practiced in is still there. It's cedar posts and, and net wire and there's sagebrush growing up in it. It's just like really classy. I don't know if anybody ever thinks about that or not, but wasn't there a, a old cell ring there or something too that they used to get on in down at Roosevelt? Yeah, you know. I mean it, it. It was a cell ring. It was like the size of this room we're in. Yeah, it's they tiny. Were, them guys was them guys. You know, I come up kind of tough uh, in a lot of lot of respects, but those guys were they were just made out of another cloth. They're yeah, the generations, you know, the great generation, those that fought World War II, and them guys were amazing people, not just the guys. The women, frequent the men went to war, went to war the, the women started building vehicles and making tires and pumping fuel and did all the jobs, you know, to mm-hmm. keep us keep us winning. Yeah. So did you travel with Lane at all? Oh, yeah, travel. So let's hear a Lane Frost story then. Well, actually, I've got a really... Uh, it's kind of a somber story too, but uh, Lane had Mr. T at Fort Worth at a pro tour, and I had Sip and Velvet, and both of us was defeated the same day. I got on Sip and Velvet three times. He got and that was like wh- the rankest horse in your day, right? Well, Sip and Velvet was he, he had my vote. I mean, there was a lot of lot of horses that was really really capable, but that horse was was pretty rank, and so was Mr. T, a rank bull, and. But anyway, buck me off in the bareback ride and buck, buck Lane off in the bull ride in the same day at Fort Worth that year. But but uh, Rob Juker is from right here in Buell, and Rob was the steer wrestler on my team when they had the pro tour on, I say my team, the, we was on Valvoline Motor Oil's team. I was the bareback rider who was the, the steer wrestler, and he called me, and, and we was going to, we was, headed to Casper, Wyoming to a pro tour over there. And he's, he called me and he says, hey, he says, we got to stop in Ogden and pick up Lane Frost. He's going to catch a ride on over to Casper with us. And I said, oh, good. I said, that'll make it good. And so we stopped in Ogden and picked up Lane and went on to Casper to the pro tour. And I was just getting my horse rigged up and, and Lane was around there. And pretty soon somebody come over there and they said, hey, Lane, you've got an emergency phone call in the rodeo office. And so he left and pretty soon he come back over there. By then I was in the, in the dressing room and he came back in the dressing room and he, he said, uh, Uncle Joe got killed in a car wreck on the way home. And Uncle Joe had brought him to Ogden to meet Rob and I. And then he was killed in a car wreck on his way back to Roosevelt that day. And so uh, I knew I knew Joe. Joe was one of the guys ahead of me. That you know, I'm mean, maybe a generation ahead of me. That was one of the guys I looked up to, and good cowboy. And his son uh, Shane Frost still lives over there at Randallette, and and that's probably why Joe Frost, his boy, is named Joe Frost. I'm sure of it. Yeah, Shane's Shane's boy is Joe, and Joe's been to the finals now in the bull riding. So, and his other boy. <laughs> made it last year Josh. so joe's lane's nephew then yes. yes yeah yeah and you got a pretty good story about shane too don't you shane frost was it shane that got um that bull cut his neck at moab or was that oh, somebody no, else no that was that was another boy yeah uh dustin uh i don't yeah remember maybe Dustin's last for name. some reason i thought it was was shane but yeah i know I mean, the stories run extremely deep. I mean, we could go on and on and on. Yeah, that was that was a pretty scary deal there. It was when I was, had my stock contract and deal, and I had a bull that nobody rode that year. That was that was the year that he was unridden, and and uh, uh, at Salt Lake with Wasey Kathy, he he throwed Wasey off about three seconds, and they marked the bull twenty four or twenty five twenty five, and. Uh, and for those of you that don't know how they score, 25 is as high as you can get for one judge. So yeah, that's, that's pretty that, phenomenal. It was a perfect bull score, and, and uh, he threw Wasey about to the lights in the 
in the Salt Palace, and I'm not exaggerating one bit. I mean, the bull was big. He weighed 2,100 pounds and was a cat, just a absolute athletic phenomena. And he got waist. He kind of ripped back off of his arm and throwed him out the back door, and he went way high. And when he come down, he couldn't get his feet and his hands or whatever under him, and he ended up landing right on the kind of his upper butt and with his feet out in front of him. And he, I could tell he was kind of hurt, and I got over the fence and stepped out there. Wasey and I have been friends for many years, too. We filled our permit, actually, the same day in Montgomery, Alabama, split second and third in the bareback riding, so clear back in the day. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, I walked out there to him. I says, you all right, Wasey? And he says, damn, a bull that big ain't supposed to buck that hard, he says. <laughs> I said, yeah, no, I, I said he's pretty bucky. But anyway, he qualified that year for the national finals rodeo, uh, they're going to use him in the rank pen, and uh, he broke his back the day before I was going to load to go down there. So I lost. That, that bull's name was Cobra. He was he was really an amazing. He's bull. actually sitting in the corner over there. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh wow. Yeah, actually, Sage asked me today if I was ever going to hang that up, and uh, the picture on the front of it. I remember one winter you were. You were uh, you you always like having projects and uh, pretty good artist. So he painted a, a pretty cool picture on that skull. But I remember I remember going back there in the back because it was in that uh, pasture on the back side of that thirty acres, right on the other side of the canal. He was yep. down there, and and uh, I think me and Grandpa actually took care of him yep. while you were at the the national finals. Yeah, I was yeah. I was in hopes he could make it, but. Uh, in reality, I knew better. I mean, you know, it's just, it's, that's one of the things the guy hates. And I think that all goes back to our, you know, your whole philosophy here, you know, I mean, we got to give them the absolute every chance that we can. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like we owe it to them, you know, they, they can't take care of themselves. And, you know, that's one thing that you've always been extremely good about is, is doing every every avenue and every effort that you can. I mean, I've heard you say it multiple times. We can only put them down once. Yeah. So. And I hate doing that. I I don't do it unless it's like the very last option. And and uh, actually, very seldom is it the the last option. But from time to time, it is. I mean, that's. So- so as this was going on, you know, we've talked a lot about the, the rodeo stuff and the, your career and, and things, but along the way here, um, you know, as you had your rodeo company, you started using your own herbs. I mean, this is how silver lining really come about is because you were using the herbs for your own livestock and, and, uh, really had no clue that anybody else knew anything about it. Well, that's right. Mom and dad were around, and mom had a business where she was taking care of a lot of people, you know, with the herbs and, and naturopathic modality. And and dad uh, was extremely knowledgeable about the plants and what time of year they was ripe and what animals used them and what the effects was on them. And so I had I had a couple of people there that was that was really really good for me to learn from and. Uh, <clears throat> And so I kind of, I, I relied on them, but it took kind of a leap of faith a time or two, too. I had, I just bought a, a load of roping calves and used them that, that summer. And now I was trying to get, uh, get them heavy enough to sell to try to recoup my money that I'd paid for them that spring. And, and I went to help Jay Hogan gather some cattle off his country up by uh, northern Idaho and... <clears throat> And while I was gone, Lori called me and said that I had two dead calves. And I said, what the heck? Because they was doing so well. And and uh, anyway, as I was talking to Jay's uncle, he says, well, it's probably overeaters. He says, they'll do that once in a while. And I said, well, what the heck? And so I called my mom and I says, what do we got that we can give these calves if they've got overeaters? She said, she told me and I said, well, and it was pretty much in, infection fighters and immune supporting herbs. And so I just, I says, Mom, I said, this is pretty serious. I says, you know, and, and I wasn't totally on board with everything that she did at the time because I'd never been taught that, but I knew she was quite successful. And so when I, I, I cut my my trip up there short and come right home and, and uh, 
went and got the herbs and got it in their feed and I never lost any more calves and and uh, then as you was growing up as you was learning to rope calves and so on I was trying to supply roping calves for you and I never I never uh, had the money to buy the best calves and so I'd buy them little leppy calves and and try to save them and I never lost a calf I, I never lost a calf in all of those years buying the cheaper calves. And I do remember you telling me, no, you can't <clears throat> rope those calves today, though. <laughs> <laughs> I just, that's all I had was the rope and drizzles. I got to keep I my streak going here. <laughs> I was a little kid and I just wanted to rope anything in sight. Well, uh, that's not unlike a lot of the kids that's been raised on, no. the, on the farm and ranch. They've, uh, they've roped or rode those that wasn't supposed to be roped or rode yet. Yeah. So. And, and, you know, I mean, I roped about anything there was to be roped on the place, including ostriches at one point, but that's for another podcast. Yeah. yeah let's not go into the ostrich business. I, I thought maybe that was going to be like a dark hole that you guys are trying to forget in your life or, or it something. Is. It, it is. is. Yeah. So if anybody wants to hear about the ostrich uh, story, you know, DM us and maybe we'll fit that into another podcast. So anyways, no. So. So when did you realize, hey, I want to start making a business of silver lining? Well, um, I shouldn't say silver lining because you've had silver lining about everything. Yeah. Silver lining rodeo company. I don't even remember. Did you call the ostrich business silver lining too? I don't think we caught, got a chance to call the ostrich business anything before. <laughs> before that we gun, were, no good. <laughs> yeah, Ostriches. We, we called them called. lots of names. <laughs> but I did have fun with them from time to time too. But. Yeah. But anyway, uh, I was I, I was feeling a need mostly for my mother's clients. You know, she was taking care of the the people's needs and so on. But from time to time, people would contact her and say, "Hey, I've got a horse that's got some problems here, and I've got a dog, or I've got a what whatever a cow or whatever it is, and uh, what have you got?" She'd say. She just send them to me, and so I was trying to make a living at that time. I was, I was uh, always strapped for money and needing needing money. I'd quit riding bucking horses at the time, and I was I was using all my money in the rodeo company to keep my rodeo company going, and so I uh, I would pretty much just stop what I was doing and go and fill the need at my mother's store she had some bulk herbs in the back room and i'd go in there and i'd mix up what they needed and put a label on it just hand write the label and put it on a a a baggie a plastic sandwich baggie and write the instructions how to use it on there and put it in a ups box and and ship it out so i was shipping a pound every day or two and then it got to where there was Somebody had ordered three or four pounds of something, and so I'd order, I'd fix that up for them and send it off to them. And pretty soon, I started writing sticky notes and and going in and making four or five pounds of different things. And one day, Lori come home, and and I had a whole wall full of sticky notes. People had ordered stuff, and and by then she was helping me. We'd we'd ordered bulk herbs for the house, so I didn't have to run clear into town to do it and and uh laurie was helping me mix them was mixing them in ice cream buckets with lids on them would just put the herbs in there and shake them back and forth and about like about like i make uh cinnamon sugar for my kids (laughs) (laughs) right right. same same kind of deal but just mix them herbs up and send them off and she come home one day and a whole wall was full of sticky notes and she said oh my gosh i says all right laurie at the time she was cleaning houses for people she was a a maid and would be gone all day cleaning houses and then when she'd get home in the evening I'd be getting done with what I was doing and would mix herbs and send them out by then it was started catching on I says you know we need to take care of this and you know just push on a little bit maybe we can do some good so anyway that winter is the first winter I went to Arizona um, to pass out some literature and try to look at some horses and check people's horses for them. I was doing kinesiology so I could check them out that way. I had not yet learned the acupressure points and different things like that. So, But I was in, in search of what I could do to make it better. And 
And I realized we sat right there at the Dynamite Arena in, in Scottsdale, and I sent uh, brochures out one day to 13 different states and two provinces of, of Canada. And I thought, why would a person not be here? You know, I mean, this is the place to be to make your business move forward in the in the livestock business. So I started looking for ground down there and ended up buying a place. And, of course, all the rest of it's kind of happened since then. But and And now we're a week away from heading back to Arizona for the year. Well, there's Maybe. a possibility. <laughs> there's a possibility. Yes, yeah, yeah. no storm in the forecast, so Arizona looks pretty appealing when that starts to happen. Yeah, when you when you can rope steers uh, in January and they're, they're having record lows in, in the north country, it's it, that's just appealing. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, I'm... I appreciate you coming on the show today. I, I, you know, sometimes take it for granted that, you know, of who my dad is and, and, uh, because I've, I've been raised around you, I hear the stories all the time, but when you sit back and, and think about them, you know, you, you're like, man, I want to share these stories with, with everybody. Um, cause they're fun to hear. Uh, you got some good ones. And, uh, so I'm, I'm really happy that you was able to come on the show today. Well, thanks. It's fun to be here fun to be involved a little yeah so anyways but uh you know i'd like to probably get you on sometime else because there's so much more that we can talk about um i want to get in depth about silver lining a little more and and uh you know talk about some stuff there but um chance you got anything you want to add to that uh you know i think it's always fun to listen to the rodeo stories i always get a kick out of them especially when we run into your old rodeo buddies and and you guys get to get to tell the stories. so it's always so fun uh you know listen to the silver lining stories i mean what a legacy you have i mean you've helped so many horses dogs and people changed my life along with hundreds of others people and yeah i mean it, you you have a legacy for sure and and, and uh, just being able to you know show with people because you know some people that you know just learn about silver lining um don't really understand where it came from and to share that story uh i have so many people that ask me you know do you know are you a horse guy and i'm like it heck yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah i'm a horse guy i i've been around it for a while and then, and and i just want to share these stories because i want people to understand that you know, we are, we, we are horse guys. We are country guys. We've been around this and we don't. Not every horse has a chance to go out in the natural environment and pick what it really needs to eat. And that's, that's why we're doing what we're doing is we're trying to supply that, that need that we took away from them with the fences. Mm -hmm. You know, God made everything they needed. If we take all the fences down and turn all the livestock, all the animals loose, they'd find what they needed and they find it when they need it and it it's appealing to them it sounds good and they eat it and they and it keeps them healthy but when they're in a domesticated environment they got fences around them they've got to be given the stuff or we are essentially starving starving them to death right under our own care absolutely so more of the moral of the story folks variety is key silver lining packages that variety Dad, Mickey, thanks for coming on the show today, and until next time. Thanks, man. It's, it's been fun to be here. Thank you. Adios. Adios.